Hello and uh, welcome to our audience across uh, Europe and beyond. Um, this, my name is Jan Pomowski. I'm the Secretary General of, of the Guild of European Research Intensive Universities. And it is, it is my great pleasure indeed to uh, welcome you to this concluding um, event of our seminar series on uh, research-led education for the digital age. And this is a seminar series that kicked off um, exactly a year ago with an insight paper authored by uh, Joe Anguri. Um, before I uh, introduce this uh, today's session, may I encourage you um, to really um, share anything that you wish to share, your, your reflections on what you hear and any, um, uh, anything you, you'd like to raise uh, in the chat. Um, and if you have questions, uh, please uh, pose them through the Zoom Q&A and we'll uh, try and respond to them as we go uh, through the, uh, the program. Also, please engage with the event on Twitter um, and the hashtag is uh, hashtag future of education. So um, first of all, um, it's, it's a great pleasure to welcome for the first panel, um, those authors who were really a seminal to this to this, this series of events throughout. That's Joanne Guru, Joanne Guri, who's the author of, of our Insight, Insight paper. Um, but she was also really supported uh, by a writing team of uh, consisting of Auna Falk from the University of Tartu, Berit Eicher from Aarhus University, um, and Karen Amos from uh, Tübingen. And um, in the lead up to the Insight paper, there was a, there was a really intensive um, series of meetings on a sort of bi-weekly basis between this group um, to really think through what it might mean um, to um, reflect on pedagogical change, educational change at a time uh, when the, um, when, you know, during the pandemic, 100% of our universities were online. Um, what, and what were the implications in particular for research-led uh, education? Um, and this, uh, we launched this Insight paper a year ago, and then we, we had a number of uh, seminars uh, where we explored in greater depth some of the key contentions of the uh, Insight paper and of that work of, of Joe and her colleagues. And so there were a number of uh, key um, areas that, that the Insight paper contended in. First of all, that the future of education in higher education was both digital and analog. And to um, explore that in greater depth, we had a seminar series then um, more recently uh, hosted by the University of Glasgow, where the university and where we all together really reflected on how we could then translate some of these um, thoughts and ideas into practice in, in concrete ways in terms of the, the learning um, produced and, and um, uh, engineered at, at the university. We then had another um, area, space of thought, which was really around the distinctive support, and the, the emphasis here on the distinctive support that research-led universities should give to uh, lifelong learning. And uh, that was really um, authored, by, uh, and, and, and that was really then um, pursued in further greater depth by uh, Joan Guri at a seminar hosted uh, at, at Warwick University. Um, another really important area of a discussion and debate has been about around quality assurance systems. How can we develop the kind of quality assurance system that really enable uh, rather than hinder educational transformation? And that was really uh, taken further and, and discussed in much, at much greater depth by a seminar um, led by uh, Berit Eicher at Aarhus University and her colleagues, uh, and in particular Susan Wright. And then finally, there was um, a, um, a real focus on internationalization and how the future of internationalization could play into role into pedagogical change. And that was really hosted by, uh, by, uh, the, uh, by Arne Falk and the uh, and Tatu uh, University. So um, we, uh, and it's wonderful now to bring these discussions to a close and what, what, these, um, what these seminar series had in common was really a common um, uh, engagement with this question of how universities need to stay true to their values. They need to stay true to what they're really good at, while at the same time being really open to the, to the educational, uh, to, the, to the societal and economical uh, transformations around them. And this kind of tension um, is, is something that uh, we'll really explore in much greater uh, depth uh, today uh, at the seminar. And so I'm really welcome, I'm really pleased to be able to welcome um, uh, um, 
Karen Amos. Uh, Karen Amos is Vice Rector of the uh, University of Tübingen, uh, and she will uh, kick off our um, seminar um, uh, this even uh, this after, this morning rather um, with uh, with some reflections on um, really this past year, but also this this, this central question about um, the relationship between educational transformation and um, who we are as as universities. And this will be followed up by a reflection, by a discussion uh, of the key um, partners in this um, in in this uh, venture um, around our insight insight paper. And then in the second part of this seminar today, we will open up to a, a wider discussion uh, with colleagues from the sector from uh, across Europe. But first of all, I'm really pleased to uh, welcome Karis, Karin. Uh, Karin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jan, uh, for this wonderful summary of uh, where we've been uh, so far, uh, where we've taken this wonderful paper authored uh, by Joe. And uh, it is my pleasure um, to welcome everybody, to welcome the friends, colleagues, experts, students and guests. Thank you very much for joining us um, on the seminar this morning. It is really my sincere pleasure to share with you uh, some of the thoughts that uh, we derived from the uh, great paper um, authored by Joe and that you know the group which uh, Jan mentioned helped uh, to write and support it. Uh, but you know, also very many thanks to you, Jan, for bringing us together and for the wonderful support of Ivana. So the Guild um, has played uh, an, a crucial part uh, in developing these ideas. And when I um, want to share the thoughts, these are not just mine, they are really uh, the groups and beyond. So special thanks also to Romitza uh, Yuku, a wonderful colleague, uh, from our European University Alliance, Civis, um, who is um, really very seasoned uh, in discussing higher education policy and uh, has also greatly inspired uh, my thoughts. So what I'm trying to do uh, in this uh, paper um, is um, kind of taking a bird's eye view, as it were, to reflect, uh, as Jan Palmoski mentioned, on our role as universities in the larger ecosystem of the 21st century, uh, which puts great expectations um, on universities to provide answers and solutions for complicated and challenging times that we usually turn as a disrupted age. And my main contention is that we indeed should master all of our resources to shape this difficult but also promising part of global education policy, which we designate with the terms of the Bologna process and the European higher education area. So my overall thesis, if I were to summarize it, uh, would be something like this, that universities are multi-layered institutions that are simultaneously uh, embedded in different contexts of space and time. This is why I think it's also important to look to the past, because the past continues to be part of our present and continues to influence where we're going. Uh, so these entanglements of space and time are one characteristic uh, of universities. And another one is that the national and the international also um, um, constitute a complex interrelationship network as or interrelationsgefüge, as my colleague Jürgen Schriever uh, used the term in a seminal paper in 1994 already. And this is especially true when it comes to teaching. And I think that the national is not simply kind of inside and the international and not merely outside, but um, that it also constitutes, um, you know, this very challenging, uh, but um, also promising entanglement. Um, so the first step that I would like to take is to take us back uh, to Bologna uh, University in the 11th century, because this is really amazing. If we look at the foundation of the Alma Mater Studiorum uh, a thousand years ago, um, then 
we find a great reminder um, of where we have been uh, at that time a thousand years uh, ago. And I would like to emphasize that with regards to some crucial aspects, we already had been a thousand years ago where we wish to be again today in a European space, of course, a very different European space than as now, um, but a European space nevertheless, uh, where students and their teachers moved around freely, where language was not an obstacle, where students contributed significantly to the governance of their university and the organizational structure by Naciones in the original Bologna University was only loosely connected to what we mean when we speak of nations today. So without overstretching the point, um, but nevertheless to make it, in a sense, Bologna in the 11th century was more European uh, than the Bologna process that takes its name from this venerated institution is today. And why is this the case? Because in the thousand years since the founding uh, of Bologna, um, the most important shift uh, that has taken place when it comes to university is their embedding in nation states. And this has become um, a trend since the late 18th century uh, was continued in the 19th and then completed in the 20th century where the nation states became or where the nation state became a universal model. And nation states and notions of modernity go together. And as modern societies are dynamic and changeable, they emphasize progress and individual betterment. And indeed, we might say when we look at, for example, macro sociological neo-institutionalism, or if we take a cultural perspective, uh, cultural studies perspective following, uh, for example, Benedict Anderson, we can claim that the fate of the individual and the progress of the collective are, inextricab are inextricably linked in national practices and narratives. And in a sense, we might even say that the nation state itself is a pedagogical progress oriented institution that builds on human capital avant la lettre by establishing common socialization patterns for the next generation, passing on values and norms, calling on the person, which is a social category by itself, to contribute to the advancement of society at large. And in this context, it is that universities came to be considered the keystone of the education system uh, because of their double mission of research and teaching. So they assumed their modern roles of motors, of innovative and original thinking. Um, they became critical evaluators of where their societies were heading. They were important players, if not drivers, of economic success and the latter mainly uh, through the institutionalization of the natural sciences and technical disciplines. And just by way of very brief illustration, let me take my own university, the University of Tübingen as an example. Um, it was founded in 1477. And uh, the uh, building on the right is one of the original buildings in the very center of town, the Alte Aula, which is the main uh, building of where university teaching took place uh, for many, many years, not to say centuries. And 400 years later, um, the image on the left shows where the university had uh, was moving. And there you see, uh, buildings that showed the success of the natural sciences. So these were buildings of physics, chemistry, biology. And just uh, to show the dynamics we have today, this is where the, uh, this is the current look of the natural sciences uh, in Tübingen. So if we take from this very brief overview, um, a closer glimpse um, at the 1960s, um, I think it is worth looking at because the 1960s were the, uh, the, the latest big reform movement before we now um, have 
the European Bologna uh, uh, process and the European higher education area. So the 1960s were characterized by um, a uh, great enthusiasm for higher education. Uh, it was an era where great expectations met with optimism and the political will to invest in new universities as harbingers of a brighter future. In the early years of the decade, an unprecedented boom to establish new institutions in regions away from the country's centers testifies to this international faith. A very recent study on utopian universities shows exactly this the international commitment to build new institutions to absorb the growing demand for tertiary education and the conviction that universities would be society's driving engines. To quote the title of a famous study, it was a moment of modernity of which the often brutalist architecture was the outward sign. Um, so this is a, uh, uh, a view of the University of uh, Bielefeld, um, uh, exactly following this pattern of having uh, universities, new universities in regions where there had not been any before, um, and also having very um, uh, pragmatic, very instrumental architecture, um, short ways to reach the buildings uh, with very functional, um, but at the same time also um, incorporating this utopian uh, vision. Um, these institutions uh, obviously often had a different mission than their older counterparts, and they too differ across, but also within countries. It was a unique period in another aspect too, as grand visions of individual designers came together with a commitment to public investment. One could cite many famous examples from the UK, the University of Warwick being, uh, and uh, uh, you know, this is a tribute uh, to uh, Joe and Jan. Uh, uh, I only found uh, this artist uh, impression of the humanities building um, and, and not a, a photograph, but it shows, uh, I, I think, better than the photograph, uh, really the, uh, the, the how the imagination was stimulated uh, in that uh, area. And um, one really feels the utopian moment in it. Uh, but besides the UK example, one could also uh, quote Clark Kerr uh, for the US with his vision of multiversity uh, for the California State University system, or um, Helmut Chelsky, uh, who uh, is basically the person behind the University of Bielefeld in Germany. So the point that needs to be stressed here is that these universities were primarily seen as promoting national projects of progress and well-being, um, projects uh, contributing to the public good and national economic development, although they were already more globalized than their precursors. Now, if we look at the great reform movement in the 21st century, the European higher education area, um, then uh, we um, immediately see that this is the most um, important uh, reform project in our context and a very prominent expression of global higher education policy. It is a trend um, of you know, a, a closer collaboration and uh, shaping uh, policy uh, that we find uh, large international organizations really playing an important part in it, such as the European Union, of course, with its uh, uh, organizations, the European Commission being probably the most important one, but also the OECD, the UNESCO um, organizations um, by uh, the World Trade Organization, uh, to name only a few. Um, the European uh, higher education area comprises a very diverse set uh, of uh, close to 50 different countries, and it's a project that is widely discussed in all parts of the world. 
In Africa, for example, uh, the Bologna process, which is often used interchangeably for the European higher education area, is seen as a model strategy to overcome narrow regionalisms within countries and to further collaboration and to create synergies. Hence, we can say that the most important difference to earlier reform movements is that the international dimension has moved from backstage to center stage. In his inspiring keynote, Exploring Visions for uh, 2050, um, in a very recent conference organized by the University of Bucharest, um, a colleague from Madrid, Xavier uh, Valle Lopez, uh, coined the term Euro Global Universities. And this addresses exactly the question. Well, how should European universities position themselves globally in their local manifestations? In a recent article, Jungblut, Maaßen and Elken remind us that the European higher education area was launched along with the 10th anniversary of the Bologna process with the main objectives of creating more coherence, compatibility um, and um, uh, yeah, uh, that the main objectives were um, coherence and compatibility across institutions of higher education. The participating countries committed themselves to the core values of academic freedom, institutional autonomy, freedom of expression, independent student unions, and free movement of students and staff. And according to Jungblut and his colleagues, technical issues and mobility moved to the front since then, while the concern with values has decreased over time. This assessment is corroborated by many other studies dealing with international education policy. The combination of institutionalization and normalization of such concepts as the knowledge-based economy or knowledge society are mutually reinforcing on all policy levels and by all major actors so that they appear almost without alternative. And if we add to this the digitalization, which privileges the measurable and quantifiable as an important governance tool, the marginalization of concerns with values such as autonomy and academic freedom, as well as other grand visions of the university is an almost inevitable consequence. However, if we look historically, we see that the focus on economic aspects was vehemently contested, not only in continental Europe, but also in the UK, for example, which had always been considered to be more commercial oriented. To illustrate, I will briefly look at three studies dealing with the liberal versions of envisioning the mission of universities. So there are three um, examples, one by uh, Stefan Collini in 2017, who reminded us that uh, for about 150 years after universities started to assume something like their modern form in the early 19th century, the fact that they represented in some sense an alternative ethics or antidote to the com commercial world was precisely one of the justifications for their existence. And to corroborate this view, he quotes, among others, T.H. Huxley, who is otherwise known as a champion of applied science, uh, Joseph Chamberlain, mayor of Birmingham, and one of the leaders of the commercial world in the UK, and Ernest Rutherford, the father of nuclear physics. All of them stress that universities should pursue pure knowledge unhampered by it by application. The second instance is taken from Sheldon Rothblatt's uh, The Modern University and Its Discontents, where he discusses the influence of this humanistic tradition, emphasizing the importance of teaching the liberal arts against organized research. The example typical for much in the German discussion would be Dieter Lenzen's treatise on Bildung statt Bologna, 
Bildung instead of Bologna, which somewhat simplistically reduces the Anglo-Saxon tradition to be merely commercially oriented and juxtaposes it with the Humboldtian ideal of Bildung durch Wissenschaft, character formation through learning and scholarship. The point that Collini makes, and I con con concur with him, is, quote, what societies have wanted from their universities has been historically variable, internally contradictory, and only ever partly attainable. Thus, the point that I made about the expectation today um, that universities contribute to the economic advancement has really been very strongly contested in the past. And um, to end with a quote by Ernest Rutherford, who said at the University of Bristol in 1927, he would view it as an unmitigated disaster if the university laboratories uh, were utilized for research bearing on industry. So in a sense, why should it be otherwise? Universities are pluralistic and in pluralistic and dynamic societies cannot but be confronted uh, with different and sometimes even antagonistic um, expectations. Um, to elucidate this uh, even uh, further and to look at ideational streams that uh, inform the Bologna process, uh, I would like to draw on a, um, a lucid analysis by Blättler and Imhoff with the provocative title, um, Bologna Emeritus? Question um, mark, who identify three different ideational strands uh, that have informed the policy in the Bologna process. The first one, linking Bologna to a political project, or no, let me um, uh, name them first. So the three ones would be either uh, the mission of the university is a political project, or it has a purpose of its own that can be democratic or can also have a different form or universities should provide a marketable service. And we find all of these uh, strands in um, European higher education policy. So the first one links to links bol the Bologna process to political projects that can be varying in focus. So it could be full employment, it could be uh, societal welfare, it could be economic growth. So this strand is pragmatic and thus it does not link university uh, or other forms of higher education to a strong uh, ideology such as marketization or democratization, but lends itself to pursue different aims. Higher education in this view is an instrument to solve problems. The idea that became hegemonic within the Bologna process was the idea that higher education was to contribute to economic competitiveness. This implies governing research to invest in the most promising research projects in terms of innovation for the European economic area. Regarding teaching in this context implies an emphasis on competencies for further employment and a stress on learning outcomes. Students are to acquire the competencies central to a dynamic and innovative economy. Thus, the emphasis is less on developing a reflexive relation to the world as rather a form of self-formation that answers to the needs of given circumstances. The second ideational stream stresses, and this would be very much the Humboldtian one, that higher education should not serve other purposes outside of itself and is more normative in orientation. Higher education in this regard is it seen as an end by itself, leading out of the Kantian notion of self-imposed immaturity. Thus, university education stresses the, un the unity of uh, teaching and research. Free research based on curiosity uh, in this view automatically leads to progress and the mediation of research results as well as their critical discussion and reflection go hand in hand. 
Higher education is a societally central institution whose aim is emancipatory. A second and related aspect stresses higher education as a public good and emphasizes public responsibility, thus fighting attempts of commodification. A third aspect is concerned with self-determination, emphasizing that the members of the institution should organize themselves. This may take on different forms, but usually results in embracing that higher education should be a democratic right and, and open to everyone, independent of their social, economic and other circumstances. But of course, we also find more elitist positions within this view. When this ideational stream is invoked in the Bologna process, it is linked to the demand for a sufficient public alimentation, safeguarding that universities fulfill their mission of being places where research and teaching can be freely executed. The last uh, ideational stream views higher education as a global and competitive economic sector in itself. In this view, higher education provides a tradable good within a market peopled with consumers and providers of services. The consumers, students, want to increase their human capital and research results can be sold in a lucrative marketplace. This perspective is also normative because the market logic is not considered uh, is not considered to be, excuse me, because the market logic is uh, considered to be the most appropriate way to pursue political aims, but also because it believes in the success of the best. In this view, um, research and teaching, or looking at research and teaching as a marketplace, as the best way to ensure that the best succeed and that progress is attained in teaching and research. The free play of the market forces is to be left unhampered uh, from outside inferences, privatization and study fees, business investments in the field of research and the political safeguarding of procedural self-regulation are hallmarks of this perspective. Um, I'm, uh, I, I need to ask very briefly, how much time do I have? Am I already over? I, I think, no, no, do, 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 do continue. But... <laughs> okay, so, thank you, no, I'm sorry, just panic. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so talking about uh, the uh, ideational uh, um, streams actually helps us to see that within the process, within the political process itself, we have different strands that sometimes uh, conflict with each other and that have to be calibrated. Um, and this is one of the challenges um, that we are facing when we uh, look at uh, the European higher education area. So, um, so far, let me summarize what, what I've been trying to do thus far. So what, I'm, I'm, what I was trying to do thus far is to look at the history of the Bologna process as part of a global higher education policy that was introduced against the background of common values in the Europe, uh, of, the uni of, of the European universities as stated in the Treaty of the European Union. Um, but that is also characterized by expressing variations in the idea of the university, um, contains different ideational strengths and national specificities, in structure, administration, tradition, modes of deliverance of research and teaching. To reconcile these challenges or reconcile these ten tensions was a challenge from the start. Linking the European higher education area to the even grander project of modernizing societies and strengthening the economic realm of Europe with the globally pervasive discourse on knowledge societies or knowledge-based economies gave the process purpose and direction. And signaling that the process had, had reached maturity uh, um, is um, shown by the fact that the first part was more concerned with establishing the structures 
and uh, the legal framework such as the ECTS system and the two, uh, two um, respectively uh, three-tiered uh, study cycles. Uh, but these structural commonalities um, have been expanded on um, ever since. At the same time, they met with the autonomy of the universities and the national so sovereignties in education. And so even though we agreed on common structures, the way that they were implemented and executed varies significantly. So this is why despite uh, Lisbon, despite Erevan, where, where we had major communications about uh, automatic recognition and about uh, joint programs, um, this still is a large challenge. Um, and one reason for this, of course, is that notwithstanding this more globalized, internationalized higher education policy, universities still maintain strongly linked to their local ecosystems and their local um, employment markets for which uh, they mainly qualify their students. Um, and this can lead to a certain tendency to go back to business as usual and, and your default mode as it were. And it has been observed in, in many instances that uh, sometimes the implementation of Bologna is more ritualistic um, than um, seizing the opportunities uh, for deep uh, changes. So the, the, the modernizing um, uh, potential of the European higher education area is not always recognized. And sometimes it is viewed as an encroachment or an imposition from the outside that but this view really completely underestimates uh, the complexity of the uh, endeavor and is very, very simplistic. And th therefore, I would like to draw your um, attention to an image um, used by Blattler and Imhoff in 2019, where they, um, uh, where they compare the European higher education area uh, to a huge construction site. Uh, an enormous construction site, in fact, uh, with 48, 49 individual building owners, um, with their national ministries, and with the Bologna process kind of as a general contractor. So there are many different building plans, supervising teams, coordinating institutions on many levels that make the endeavor extremely complex. And at the same time, while construction is going on, these construction sites are in full operation. So on the one hand, it looks very kind of airy, something is developed that is not quite there yet. And at the same time, it's very solid because um, uh, institutions are fulfilling uh, their mission. Um, and we should also not forget that uh, this takes place within a two or multi-level game context, which is the levels, the policy levels communicate with each other and feedback uh, to each other. So um, this is why we still find huge variations um, despite the common orientation um, that has been initiated with Bologna. Um, now I come to the conclusion, and these are the points that I would like to um, discuss with you, uh, or maybe in, in future um, occasions further discuss with you. First of all, I think that we meet, need a mindset that is conducive to disjunctive thinking. And um, with the disjunctive thinking, I mean to accept that things are separate and sometimes even disparate, and yet they belong together. So that opposites can still be united because things put in disjunction with each other play on different levels and therefore do not constitute alternatives. A disjunctive relation is irreducible and cannot be thought of from one side only. And although we have philosophical traditions globally 
um, uh, for this, we tend to fall back to thinking in terms of either or. Um, but disjunctive thinking, I think, is more appropriate to the complexity uh, of the endeavor. The second point is that we should reflect on our traditions and values, but with a future directed perspective. Our ecosystems have become hugely uh, complex and the societal challenges to which we need to respond have become ever greater. And in that regard, I would like to emphasize uh, the role of networks and alliances such as the Guild and uh, the, uni uh, the European University Alliances um, as playing very important roles in devising strategies and responses uh, to the disruptions um, um, of our times. Um, another point um, I would like to emphasize is that despite of all of the complexities, um, it's a core mission, an ongoing core mission of universities to work with young people who are exploring and discovering their talents, who become aware of who they want to be, where they want to focus on in life, and that it's still our core mission to engage with them, also in questions of sense and meaning. And that in this regard, education via Wissenschaft uh, remains a tenet. In this sense, it is not student center versus teacher uh, centered, but it continues to be both. And uh, as uh, Joe has uh, so brilliantly worked out uh, in the inside paper, um, the future is not either or. And this is the, the, the lesson that we've learned from the uh, pandemic and the digitalization we had to undergo during the pandemic, uh, that the thing that we missed most was direct face-to-face -face, um, contact uh, with our students and our colleagues. And if we would not have this direct uh, contact, we would also um, have uh, the greatest difficulty of, ma of uh, making, uh, of enabling political and civic engagement. So I fully agree with, uh, agree with Joe that the future is neither fully digital nor fully back to business as usual. But nevertheless, um, we have a certain um, danger maybe of falling back to our default mode. And this is why it's crucial, or we all think it's crucial now to rethink uh, our teaching mission and to balance uh, these tensions between disruption and acceleration, but also growth and development and thus deceleration and contemplation um, so that we need to carefully uh, consider what, which formats we employ in which circumstances. When we are training for more technical skills, shorter formats, uh, also digital formats might be perfectly fine, uh, but in other contents, we still need to um, give space and time to mature and develop. I would like to end with a quote by Peter Scott, uh, who in a consideration, in a two volume consideration 10 years ago, higher education at the crossroads between the Bologna process and national reforms wrote, Bologna has proved, this is the final slide, I think. Uh, Bologna has proved to be a creative and dynamic process with multiple effects, indirect as well as direct. And its success has greatly exceeded the intentions and aspirations of those who signed the original declaration. However, Bologna must now, 10 years ago, confront change, economic and political change, but also social, cultural, and scientific change. The way forward is for the Bologna process to go beyond Bologna, not so much in terms of adding new action lines that would inevitably encounter political difficulties, but in terms of recognizing and realizing its creative potential. There is a need for Bologna to become more systematic and more open process, more systematic because the synergies that already exist 
and the potential for new connections need to be better recognized and more open because Bologna offers European higher education a vital space for dialogue. And this I would like to strongly emphasize. Yes, I agree with this assessment. And I think that the European higher education area can be a hugely important creative space. And we as universities should seize the opportunity. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm sorry for having overstepped my time limit. Yeah, I welcome um, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, for this wonderful opportunity, because as Jan said, we have been um, in, in, a, in a very dense dialogue, but we've never been on a panel. So this is um, our opportunity now to discuss. And I uh, invite you, please, um, for, um, to make your statements, and um, then we will engage in a discussion of them. Um, Joan, would you please go first? Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, thank you very much. This has been absolutely excellent summary uh, of bringing everything together and the work. And uh, I too would like to acknowledge uh, that uh, the, 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 the paper is a team effort uh, and the, the, the really the value uh, of uh, um, the, the, the value is by us coming together. And I think this is really what uh, uh, today is also showing how much there is uh, to be achieved by the collaboration. So uh, very briefly, I would like to start with one of Karen's very well thought through and to the point conclusions that uh, that is the complexity of the ecosystems and the need to move beyond linear uh, binaries and boundaries, um, and of course the role university networks and alliances play uh, in devising strategies and responses to those to the disruptions of our age. Uh, and of course this includes the design and de the delivery of future-proof educational model, which is a multi-model, blends face-to-face -face digital, empowers students to apply learning to global problems, uh, balance acquire both disciplinary education and experience the interdisciplinarity that is necessary for addressing wicked problems, transcend national boundaries, and of course one that meets the university's uh, local and national needs in the international context. So international education and collaboration is central in this agenda and responds directly to the priorities uh, in the, uh, for example, in the current policy context and the European strategy for university. However, there are paradoxes here that still are worth further discussion in the light uh, of the previous seminars reflecting uh, the work so far, uh, today's discussions, and also possibly thinking where we're going next. Um, and although European and global partnerships uh, are, have been and are encouraged and have been increasing in the sector over the years, the actual benefits uh, of collaborative partnerships for education, particularly beyond uh, the sort of designs that are well established like the study abroad often remain implicit mm -hmm. and we really need to articulate the value of international collaboration in order to facilitate embed and grow the benefits and of course remove our barriers um, in those partnerships this is directly related with a second paradox which is the which is between the ideal of openness which of course is fundamental uh, for international partnerships and characterizes uh, as Karen put the, the, the picture so brilliantly, uh, succinctly together, the, the vision uh, for uh, the European education area and uh, the uh, European university alliances in the current environment, uh, we bring that together with the limitations that are imposed by the regulatory context. And of course, we know and agree uh, that rigid regulatory frameworks hamper and stifle the growth of good designs and the ability to really implement change. Of course, we need a regulatory context that works and one uh, that actually trusts the sector. So how do we achieve this? How do we actually get that? Mm -hmm. um, a number of initiatives are currently being piloted under the European University Alliances. We really need to share and learn from this experience. Uh, one question, therefore, I would like to discuss today and maybe also in the future is how colleagues who are with us today have seen, have experienced our experience in international collaboration as a conduit for innovation and particularly in providing our students with more diverse learning experience, 
and their reflection in relation to the capabilities afforded in current regulatory environments. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to give an example at the University of Warwick, we're co-members of the Utopia Alliance in the context of which we pilot a mo model for building innovation from uh, within uh, based on establishing uh, learning communities, connected learning communities, which bring together existing uh, education research mm -hmm. uh, and research activities. Uh, this draws on the principle of connected learning and connectedness, so mm -hmm. uh, learning is drawn existing curricular offering, research centers and hubs, industry, uh, societal collaboration and partnership in their thematic areas. This work is designed on a value-added principle. They're built on existing good practice and enable Utopia to provide a sustainable mechanism for growing and expanding through investing on what is already done and exists and is done well in education, research and societal impact, instead of solely relying on new developments. So over the years uh, of the pandemic, we've established uh, 30 learning communities. Uh, we have across disciplines, a vibrant meta community uh, of students, mm -hmm. colleagues, and uh, societal partners, which provided global learning despite the impacts uh, of the pandemic. And as an example, that involves something like over a thousand students in direct participation and the potential of about 5,000, uh, over 5,000 students in indirect involvement. That's great. The mm. core question for me, the fundamental question uh, is how and where are we going next? And how can this really important piece of work meet to uh, all this sort of what we have in the education strategy, the sort of call for universities to stimulate pedagogic innovation, for alliance to stimulate pedagogic innovation, provide a variety of spaces, creating living labs, all that uh, we actually see it. How do we move from an experiment to mainstream? Mm -hmm. This is really, to me, fundamental for achieving mm -hmm. yeah. uh, what Karen is discussing. And this is where tangible support is needed. And the heart of educational change, the heart of educational change is not on the design, is not on these great uh, ideas and startups that in what I often say is that they're a bit like fireworks and then mm -hmm. they kind of just disappear. We know that for educational change to happen, you need the support of policy, political status quo, senior management, academic colleagues, students, professional services, everybody. Pedagogic innovation is a slow process. It involves many stakeholders, and that includes, of course, colleagues who need to balance a number of different demands and priorities. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, gets us to the question that I hope we will have time to really address tangibly. How do we incentivize and recognize pedagogic innovation then? Uh, of course, and, and here is where we need to be brave and bold in enhancing career opportunities and, of course, the uh, old elephant in the room, challenging silos between research and education. Current work on looking into how to make academic careers sustainable, attractive, uh, and the need to acknowledge research, education, and innovation as co-constitutive uh, are critical and require thinking in terms of what does this mean in terms of translating support uh, for policy support for education, teaching and learning. Uh, what are the funding models for education innovation? What does this mean for the architecture, the design uh, of our universities? So I would like to close with a second question around good practice that colleagues can share in, in challenging those boundaries, the silos between research, education, innovation, and uh, how we can work together uh, in providing a more connected, synchronized, and creative, and I fully agree with Karen, creative environment uh, for our students, colleagues, and society overall. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we are having an echo, but it disappeared. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Joe, uh, for this extremely dense and absolutely necessary, uh, these absolutely necessary points that you raised. Uh, because I know that Barrett needs to leave us um, uh, soon, I, I suggest that we change the order to make sure that uh, she presents her points without being stressed, uh, because um, she cannot be with us until the end. Thank you so much, Karin, also for, for a brilliant presentation. I think you summed up so much that we knew and thought about and, and made it coherent. Uh, I would like to, to pick up on uh, what you said. I love the quote, national is not simply inside, international is not simply outside. Uh, it is uh, to illustrate uh, the trueness of this, I would like to, to, to 
tell you about the strategy of Aarhus University, where we define ourselves as an international com campus university connecting Denmark and the world. And I think that uh, also supports uh, one of your other quotes. Uh, we try as a university to do what you say, accepting that things are separate, even disparate, and yet together. On the one hand, we uh, are very proud and prized that we are grounded in a local context with a campus, rather three and soon four campuses. Uh, to illustrate this, our buildings are made of yellow bricks, uh, not because it was chosen by the architect, but because a local brick factory back in the 1930s, where we uh, had our first own buildings, donated an overproduction of yellow bricks. Um, so I think this is, symbolizes very much the local uh, uh, grounding. On the other hand, uh, our DNA, at least when it comes to research, knows no borders. Yeah. Uh, as you said, Karin, uh, university commit themselves to the free movement of, of, of students uh, and, and not least uh, staff in, in the sense of, of, of uh, researchers. Uh, I think it would be... Uh, very interesting to, to discuss uh, with the panel and with the rest of, of, of the audience today. What is our future role, role when it comes to connecting uh, country and the rest of the world? And also maybe how, how uh, do we make sure that connecting is mm -hmm. to Europe is also not leaving out the rest of the world, but, but uh, make synergies to, to, to the bridging? And especially uh, how I think we can all see that that in research, cross-disciplinary uh, research uh, will uh, help solving some of, of or it's a necessity to solve some of the major uh, problems in the world, it's climate, poverty, etc. But but how can we also make sure uh, and and more practically uh, connect? Uh, between countries and 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 uh, Europe and the world, and and I think this is even. I saw that we have a participant from Kiev. This is mm -hmm. certainly how can we also uh, through our our uh, different activities support uh, democracy. That will be all for me now. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Barrett. Thank you so much. Yeah, you raised crucial points uh, that. Um, align very well with uh, Joe's positioning um, and uh, we will certainly take up on them and uh, for the discussion round. Um, Aune, um, I'm very happy um, to invite you. Uh, thank you, Karin, and, and thank you so very much indeed, I mean, for the for the starting and for the presentation and uh, setting the framework. I mean, I'm it so much helps um, my everyday discussions and practices, and I just try to a little bit explain how it does. The story I shortly tell uh, describes very well the quote by Collini that Karin knew uh, made, uh, talking about variable and internally contradictory expectations to the universities from societies. That's our everyday life. Um, and I start with a very short historical overview of how it uh, goes in our university's history, and then I touch shortly four examples from the present, and finally I propose what is the key success uh, in, uh, in our university, although I think we could much do much better, but I think we, we somehow have managed to this contradictory, contradictory expectations. Uh, university of Tartu main mission is defined as being one of the leading research universities in Europe, and at the same time, uh, the center of academic spirit and national culture in Estonia. So these contradictory, contradictory expectations are written in our mission. Uh, in the history, we have had periods um, when one or the another of uh, their one or another part of this mission mission uh, were more clearly in front. In uh, 17th century, uh, our university was established as Latin speaking second oldest Swedish university uh, after Uppsala. And in the 19th century, uh, University of Tartu was the only German speaking university in Tsarist Russia, being very international, really part of the network of German speaking university world, what Karin, you touched also regarding the Tübingen example. Um, Estonia was at that time part of Russian Imperium, and uh, while because of historical reasons and German landlords in Estonia, ruling in Estonia, 
the language and connections, the, the, it was really oriented to the Germany, but it was a real connection between Russia, St. Petersburg and, and Germany. And, and so it, uh, it was a very, very international period in our uh, history of the university. In 1919, after Estonia gained its, its, its independence uh, a year before, Tartu University was established as Estonian National University. And throughout the last century, despite the Soviet occupation that lasted for 45 years, the main language of tuition in our university was Estonian. Mm -hmm. Of course, due to the Soviet occupation, the last century was the most difficult uh, in, in, the, in the history of our, in the 400 years history of our university, both in regards to international mission, but also a national mission because the Soviet, uh, that was not, uh, it, it didn't fit to the Soviet, uh, Soviet uh, Union. So currently mm -hmm. Estonian language is uh, one of the smallest maybe the smallest after, after Icelandic that has uh, its higher education system in national language. So these two mm -hmm. missions are constantly debated in our university. On the one hand, we have the obligation to teach the curriculum in the fields of our responsibility in Estonian language on two first levels. So in, in doctoral studies, we can, we can teach in, in English, but on the two first levels, all main fields have to be taught uh, in Estonian. With the 1.3 million inhabitants, everybody understands that the number of learners and the number of world-class academic staff with Estonian origin are limited. So on the one hand, uh, University of Tartu is clearly research-oriented, and, and for several years uh, we have been chosen to be one of the best uh, universities in so-called New Europe. Uh, we understand that if our single aim would be to achieve top positions in, uh, in, in international rankings, we should switch in many more areas to English in order to attract more and better staff and students. So this is constantly, and this is constantly recommended to us by international experts of quality assurance. So how to balance, just four examples of our everyday practice, how, how we do this. Um, uh, studying in uh, Estonian is as a rule free of charge. Uh, studying in, in English is as a rule charged. And this is how state signals its priorities. Mm -hmm. While one third of our master programs are taught in English, only three programs out of 50 uh, curricula uh, are taught in English on the first level or bachelor level. So the second uh, example is English taught curricula have different aims. Uh, so mm -hmm. some of them serve national aims actually, and some are fully oriented to international aims. Uh, for example, uh, we have several curricula uh, we need to attract graduates to Estonian labor market. For example, IT, where we need to, uh, where we teach currently 10% of our students in Estonia are studying IT, that is twice as much as in European Union in average, while Estonian labor market needs twice as more IT uh, graduates. So it's just impossible to, to attract more Estonian students and we try to attract international students. Mm -hmm. So some, uh, some uh, curricula, English taught curricula, are fully demand-based, uh, so graduates go back to their home country. For example, we, we teach medical studies uh, and mainly for the Finnish students, who, uh, because Finland, in, in Finland, the Finnish uh, country's policy is not to open more uh, uh, curricula, while there is a clear national needs, uh, need for more doctors. Uh, there are curricula where we have a unique strength uh, globally, like semiotics or IT uh, or analytic chemistry or EU-Russia relations or educational technology. But really, there is something that we have, uh, we, we have here in Tartu that, that, uh, that I think is valuable for the rest of the world. So we are teaching these fields in English mm -hmm. in order to share our, our expertise. And there are also curricula where we have to teach in English because there are not enough students or teachers in Estonia. Uh, so, so we just have to do it for national aims in order to keep uh, the, the, the field still going because otherwise we, we should have to close these fields in Estonia totally. So the third example is we provide one full year language learning opportunities for the international students who are willing to study later in Estonian language. There are not, of course, masses uh, taking this option but there are, it, it has become more and more popular. Before the war, that was uh, really uh, uh, something that Russian students uh, from Russia chose to do because they were aiming or they wanted to come to, to the European Union to study free of charge uh, here and to stay later in Estonia. 
So, and the fourth option, fourth example is uh, we are recruiting international staff with an, uh, uh, that's a clear aim. Uh, there is 16%. I think we, we, we are willing to, to increase that number. And that was also supported by European structural funds. But uh, we also have the learning Estonian language uh, at a level to be able to participate in the university work, not to teach. The, uh, it's, of course, nice if they also are able to teach in Estonian, but, but just to participate in everyday work. And this is supported and demanded. So we try to, to attract staff, but we also set the uh, set, uh, aim to, to learn Estonian language. So I'll finish uh, that um, our understanding is that the different roles of the university in achieving its mission must not be contrasted. The university uh, will be the universities only if it covers a broad spectrum of specializations and acts as a national university and international university as well as a developer of the economy and society. And in our understanding, we cannot be a good national university without offering the best possible education that we cannot, uh, while that we cannot do without being international, both in our student and staff and curricula and connections, etc. And I think I finish uh, uh, a key for this um, uh, ability to find the balance between different roles and aims, national and, and international and international and economic uh, lies in the university autonomy. In Estonia, Estonian universities are one of the most autonomous in the world, <laughs> and state has, a, by law, very little opportunities to interfere. Of course, they do have the pocket, uh, the money, but, uh, but otherwise they have really limited opportunities to interfere to the university life. So it's a task of the university to find the balance. It's not easy, and we are debating it every day in practical questions how to do that. And I'm uh, very happy if, if you have uh, examples or comments how to do it better. Thank you. I need to unmute myself. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aune. Uh, this is a brilliant illustration, um, I, I think, about uh, thinking outside of either or dichotomies or getting out of this tendency to favor one over the other, but um, to emphasize that both um, um, perspectives are needed and both are beneficial um, to universities, but also to society at large. And I also think it's very smart to invite um, foreign students, international students to study Estonian, because I mean, we are a rich uh, language, uh, linguistic area in Europe. And so it, it's great if students take opportunities um, um, to, to pursue this um, more fully maybe than they have in the past. Um, I, I would like at this point um, to invite uh, the audience uh, to join us in our discussion. Uh, also, because um, we do not, uh, we want to make sure that the audience is included um, and you might have uh, things that you, might, you would like to, to share with us um, from your own experience or where you would like to uh, take up on the presenters questions, uh, which are, of course, also extended, you know, to the entire seminar. Maybe with a brief uh, feedback to uh, Ivana, um, uh, can the audience join us directly if they uh, Yes, Karin, hello everyone. Um, we have only one comment from the audience from a vice rector at an Armenian university, but I think it's more of as a, a comment um, asking for assistance and help in terms of uh, developing a simulation center at their university. Mm -hmm. But um, I would like to invite the vice rector maybe to elaborate a bit more in the chat um, uh, while we wait for other questions as well. Yeah, thank you so much. While we wait, um, I would very much like to take up on, on Joe's, because I, I think this is crucial for how we further develop our, uh, our teaching. Um, and I think one of the, one of the impediments or, uh, yeah, impediments, it, it's not really a, a barrier in, in, in the strict sense, but it hinders us, is uh, that we continue, we, we never have the time to stop and think. So we are always developing while fully uh, running. And um, uh, I, I'm also convinced, you know, that this model that has proven to be successful in research, namely to have units, you know, collectives, uh, 
that the same would be extremely beneficial for teaching too, where way too often we still have individuals um, um, considering themselves like the sole person um, on the stage. Um, it would be much more conducive um, to take up on these models of having like these epistemic learning communities yeah. comprised of different status yeah. groups where students um, are also included in developing programs and are not just regarded as the consumers uh, of our offerings. But exactly how to do this, how to scale it, um, I think is, is, is really one of the challenges. And uh, uh, I, I think that Warwick uh, really um, has progressed uh, quite far on, on, on that road. And so this is also, you know, where the, the benefits of having this communicative space uh, comes in because we can actually share our best practices and share our experiences uh, in, in, in this regard. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's uh, that's uh, on everything you said is so important and, and something that I've been reflecting on about this uh, concept of time and space that is needed and how we have really addressed time and space in achieving uh, aims for international collaboration in research. Mm -hmm. uh, but our thinking really needs uh, much more, we, we can really probe and push and, and, and sort of challenge ourselves in terms of what this means for our educational offering. Um, and then and, and then and the part of it is also how what we have seen from our work uh, over the past one year, the importance and the significance uh, for creating that space where we come together has been for me truly invaluable. And, and it's also something that we need to think how, how we, where we're going next, how we continue. We, the, the purpose and the aim we wanted is to start a conversation and we've exceeded our, our aims, but in a sense, how can we embed that so that then it translates uh, to the actual uh, praxis? I think Aune, uh, very nice in terms of um, being able to make this transition. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, and, and and this also I think feeds feeds nice. Maybe, and I think Aune, this was a great example of uh, how uh, the national and the international are always entangled. And Barrett's comment was uh, going in in that same direction. But nevertheless, how to put this into practice? How to make it happen on the ground um, remains, of course, a challenge because now we know. <laughs> that uh, we, mm. we need to be more digital when it comes to mobility, mm. um, because we have to worry about the ecological footprint while at the same time, we want more of our students to have a, a European inter or international experience. Mm -hmm. um, but how exactly to go about this um, mm -hmm. uh, remains um, a, a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and let alone con connecting um, you know, to, the, to the wider world because and, and, and I think this is why it's interesting that Bologna is very often criticized from within, but viewed from other parts of the world, um, uh, it is recognized as a very far ahead looking um, uh, policy uh, process of, of globalization. It's, it's part of, a, of the world uh, moving together in all these respects. If I, if I can come in with a short comment just to what Joe, uh, Joe was asking the question, how to incentivize uh, yeah. pedagogical innovation. And I think it uh, maybe touches a little bit also the question of soft skills uh, that is proposed by, uh, by uh, uh, Anahit Antonian. Um, uh, we, were, we were discussing or making a summary of uh, what happened during the Corona time uh, with the e-learning opportunities and e-support for the courses. And we Two, did we made centrally sort of two um, uh, uh, like financing uh, financing decisions to to support uh, better quality um, uh, e uh, support for the for the courses and and made a summary of that and I was asking uh, from the sort of leading people uh, doing that change and I think we were very successful we, we really improved the quality and, and and many many courses applied the quality sign what we have in the in the country. 
and uh, we were asked, I were asked, I was asking, what was the crucial for for this innovation or this kind of a jump? Was it money? Was it support opportunity like uh, educational designers, what we have in the university, and we hired more of them? Uh, was it uh, good examples because we organized kind of um, uh, experiential seminars or sharing of experience seminars, or uh, or is it demand? I mean the kind of um, requirements uh, on the university level that you have to do something and uh, the response was that uh, support i mean the teachers mm. need support to do new things and yeah. they they would like to, that somebody i mean of course they they need help in a sense in the practical sense in the technical sense but they also need this kind of pedagogical support so so they if if we can save their time and 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 show them that they can do better their things that they're doing currently or more efficiently. So they are very happy to do pedagogical innovation, but they're really the support staff was the key, what was said. And, uh, but every, every, all the other ones, of course, are also important, but yeah. Uh, so I think with the good support, we can, we can change uh, pedagogical innovation. Yes, I fully agree. I, wanna, <laughs> I think this is absolutely crucial. And this has to be delivered in a way that is applicable and meaningful to the um, uh, to our academics right I mean not something that they have to transform and translate for themselves but delivered in such a way that they can use it as a toolbox as it were yeah. and, and, and go about it yeah yeah I think we also need to go beyond um, to, to understand the to sort of change and support exactly as you were saying, Karen, the sort of the interjective and the matrix, we're thinking very linearly, right? So in a sense, something starts, deliverables, deliverables, milestone, milestone, ends, product. It's a very, but we know, and there is enormous literature on process, product, the, the world has changed. Um, and, and, and I think there was a comment by a colleague that, uh, um, that Bologna, in a sense, the meanings that it takes uh, also, then the tools that we currently use need to change with the complexity as the complexity increases. And, and I think we just really need to reflect, taking into uh, the sort of the experience and what we know and the evidence we have, because this is all evidence driven in terms of the time that is necessary for educational change and the process by which this is achieved, yeah, what yeah. does this mean yeah. in terms of mapping on funding, policy cycles, uh, in terms of the other life, uh, the kind of the life that is actually so critical in order to be able to achieve this. Uh, and, and, mm -hmm. I, I, and this is really, to me, it's, it's the sort of the make or break because the success of a strategy or the success of a pilot or the success is, is well beyond the good idea. Many of the things that we're piloting, we've tried a number of times in the past. There is a lot of literature is basically mm -hmm. the support in the transition. Once the evidence is there that there is a potential, there is a scalability, uh, is the kind of process which will actually bring that from a periphery uh, to and, and, and sort of a multi-centered type of approach that starts having effect uh, to becoming a mainstream, to becoming something that could be available uh, to to, to, to all students and colleagues and so on. So I think this is something that is really timely to address as, as we are moving into the next phase of alliances, as we're moving into the post-pandemic. There is real mm -hmm. momentum here that I think will be such, such a missed opportunity, really a missed opportunity to really not capitalize on all that. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, exactly. <laughs> This is where the, the time factor also comes in. And, you know, I, I fully uh, subscribe to what you said, uh, Joe. This is 100% uh, true. And um, we really need to be uh, careful that we do not miss that opportunity because as we tend to go back into our business um, as, as more usual, uh, we probably, there, there is the danger that we push what we have achieved aside uh, to just an enhancement. Um, and, and not really thinking um, radically uh, innovative enough. And concerning this, and, and I would like, this is a point that you have made many times and, and all of you have made many times over. Uh, this is really uh, how are we uh, in the straitjacket of our own quality assurance systems. Um, and this is also a um, comment uh, from the uh, Q&A. Uh, yes, I think this is 
definitely something we need to address. So what's the right balance between um, making sure that we document our processes, that we have uh, what we need in order to trace um, what we are doing uh, without going overboard with it. Uh, so th this is, uh, again, like the entire Bologna process, a question that needs to be solved on many levels and where the different levels need to be in conversation with each other. So maybe uh, the European qualification framework and the national accreditation agencies um, also um, need to uh, um, have a stronger dialogue um, because this is nothing that universities can solve by themselves. Uh, this is something that uh, depends on the, the structures and frameworks under which they are operating. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and I think on that, uh, Anne, uh, there's a very good um, comment uh, in the uh, question, the QA um, uh, by Frederick. I'm going to pick it up because it's very close to my heart as well in terms of local, uh, local global and local global languages and particularly English as a medium of instruction. So that's a fundamental point. Uh, I'm going to, Frederick, you are addressing the question to Aune, so I'm going to pass it on, but I couldn't resist because obviously you're very close to my disciplinary heart as well. And I think uh, in the spirit of what we're discussing today, we really need to understand, to move from language to understanding multilingual pedagogic environments and work that we do uh, both uh, in, in, in the, the discipline, in Utopia, we are uh, very much working on multilingual uh, pedagogies and multilingual policies for pedagogic uh, for collaboration. Uh, and I know other alliances are working on it, or, or although this is a very good indication that I don't know the experience, I don't know what is happening, I should know, uh, the colleagues should know what we're doing. So that also indicates how we really need to share the learning and the experience as it is actually happening. So what Karen has said is so important that everybody's so stretched, there is a real danger that we're going to actually go into the demands, other demands and priorities are going to lose experience. So I think the actual question here is to really understand the rationale, as you're saying, uh, is, is very important. Uh, and, but I think we actually really need to have a proper conversation around our universities to move from languages to understand linguistic repertoires and multilingual ecosystems and to understand what that means and how we could actually really uh, benefit and empower uh, both our students, but also uh, all our partners really to, uh, to, to, to sort of uh, build uh, on their kind of linguistic capital that we have, but also think how that could mean a sort of different way of thinking the language, the languages that actually we are sort of, um, we are, we're offering our programs in and what this means in terms of the uh, regulatory framework. So Aune, I don't know if you want to um, pass it on to you. <coughs> Yeah, I didn't actually see the question of Frederick, I, maybe I missed it somehow, but I think we are also running out of time. I'm just worried about that. I, I didn't know that, so what Jan is saying about that. I think you should, you should certainly answer this, uh, Anna. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, I, but I haven't seen the original question. So uh, it's, let uh, me, I, I can read it to you. So yeah. balancing the use of the local language with the use of English is a challenge that we know very well at Ghent University, a university in the Dutch speaking part of Belgium. Um, the, with a quite a restrictive legal framework, the way in which we try to deal with is that the focus should not be on what another language, but on why the rationale. Uh, would you especially, own? I'm really sorry for sort of, I just couldn't resist, agree with the vision that we need an intermediate language, uh, English, to be able to cooperate internationally. And we need to cooperate internationally to be able to innovate and maintain the quality of our education and research. Or can this equally be done in the local language? I'm still afraid that we need this intermediate language for international cooperation because otherwise always always uh, somebody is um, is uh, is left outside because we can share the language I mean uh, they are in the in the Nordic uh, cooperation for example everybody uh, speaks uh, sort of Swedish Danish whatever Nordic language and the uh, Finns uh, older Finns uh, certainly uh, not not so many younger Finns but the older Finns also are fluent in Swedish still but then Estonians are left out outside. So we are always, if we, we're doing the Nordic cooperation, then we switch to English. So I'm, I'm afraid that we need this intermediate language, but I'm very much supporting and we try to find ways in our university how to use 
there's something that we have uh, taken as an example from Danish universities, this, uh, but I think it's, it's practiced uh, uh, in other countries also what you call a parallel language use. So everybody can speak in the language that is uh, most comfortable, assuming that the other part is understanding. And we have tried to use mm. this both Russian language, uh, both Estonian, both English, because many people sort of, uh, I mean, speaking these three languages on the level of not always fluently speaking, but at least understanding and also to encourage our international staff to, to use different languages besides English. So anyway, it's uh, this is something that we try, but I mean, we are far away from, from reaching the aim. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's a challenge, but still an important issue, right, to balance and, and to see multilingualism really as an asset uh, in Europe. But I agree that English as the closest thing to lingua franca that we have uh, is necessary also to make sure that the link between research and teaching um, on an international and global scale is maintained. So thank you so much uh, for this wonderful discussion, for these great inputs. Uh, it's been great as always to be with you and, and lovely um, to have this encounter now um, on, on the same panel. Thank you so much. And I pass on to Jan for the Thank next you. panel. Thank you, Karin. And if I can ask my panelists to, to uh, search on their cameras and as, as they do this, um, uh, if I may start just by uh, first of all, with one, one comment. So thank you very much for, to, again, to Karin and, and, and the first panel. Um, clearly, the, the questions of, of educational pedagogical transformation like of Bologna is, is a question for all of us in Europe. Um, and we've had a comment. Uh, so we, we do have uh, active participants with us from Ukraine, from Kiev, but also from other parts of the European uh, higher education area. And I think that um, especially at this time of war, um, it, is, it is all the more important that we think about our commonality, that we move together. Um, and that we also really think together these questions that are also very, very relevant in, in Ukraine, but in very different ways, of course, uh, around the importance of the digital, for instance, um, or, or uh, other, other really important questions around how uh, in universities relate to society. So I'm really grateful to those colleagues in particular for also being a part of our, uh, this, this session and engaging with us today. So I'm joined by um, a number of very distinguished panelists who've also been um, most of, mostly with this, with this project for a while. So um, I'm delighted um, to welcome uh, Vanessa de Vier saint um, who is head of the unit in charge of higher education policies um, at the European Commission um, and uh, at DG EAC. Um, and that's quite a dry title, quite a dry way for saying that she's really uh, been, a, been crucial for driving uh, change through the commission, uh, but also really being a, a, a fantastic um, a colleague and, 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 um, uh, and somebody who really engages the, with the sector uh, at a European level from, from, from um, the, the perspective of policy. And it's, it's wonderful to, to, to welcome you here. Um, Michael Gabel, who's the uh, director for, uh, for the Higher Education Policy Unit at the EUA, and therefore on behalf of its uh, um, 850 or so members, he has been really leading on, on higher education learning and teaching, including the Bologna process, lifelong learning, uh, e-learning and MOOCs uh, and so forth. Um, we have then joining us Jens Peter Gaud, who's Secretary General of the HRK, the German Rectors Conference, um, and he's been in that position since 2016. The HRK really represents almost all of the German uh, higher education uh, institutions um, and really covers everything that they deal with um, from uh, higher education, from teaching, research, innovation transfer, internationalization, and so forth. And we delight, and of course, the higher car is also closely linked to the EUA at Brussels, uh, but we're also really delighted at the Guild to have been uh, working with the higher car uh, really closely on, on internationalization and the, and the question of, of and, and, and how we uh, develop better relations with, with Africa. And fi finally, I'm really delighted to be to welcome uh, Rumitsa Yuku, who is uh, president of the Board of Trustees at the University of Bucharest and a professor of higher education at the Faculty of Psychology and Educational Sciences there. Uh, he's been hugely active at a European level as a coordinator of the Unica EduLab group, the co-chair of the four EU European degree subgroup of European universities, and he's also been a member of the EUA uh, Learning and Teaching Steering uh, Committee. Um, 
so welcome to all of you. Um, and really, I, I want to start that there have been so many areas um, that have been raised um, for us to consider. But maybe if we can de develop, first of all, a, a more in-depth discussion about the, 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 the point that Karen made around the the tension between acceleration and deceleration. Um, and, and Jens Peter, sorry, I've got to start with you because I, I, I think the, uh, because it's, you know, Bildung statt Bologna, you know, Dieter Lenzen's a really well known book in, in, in German, a um, very, uh, very famous, um, I would say, uh, rector of uh, first uh, FU Berlin, a Free University of Berlin, then Ham University of Hamburg, very successful rector. Um, but uh, this this notion that that in a way we need we need to have a a well-rounded um, individual who's 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 nourished in their thinking um, rather than a Bologna process which is all about commercialization which is all about um, creating a, a kind of almost an educational machine um, can you and, and and to be fair I mean I think one hears a lot of these kinds of concerns in especially German academia I would say. Have have we gone beyond that, or are we still there? What what's your what's your take on this? Mm. Yeah, and thanks a lot for having me. Hello to the colleagues. Hello to everyone who's listening. It's a big pleasure to to be here. And I mean, I, I have to say that the presentation and discussions we had in the last uh, ninety minutes were really excellent. So it was a really fantastic presentation, summing all the issues up. I think, and I mean to answer or to try to answer your question. My personal conviction is that we have gone beyond that. I mean, it was really important and maybe still is um, to make the point strong. And um, uh, Vanessa knows that, that it's, it's, it has been for several years a kind of a strong discussion point, let's put it, especially between the, between the German research system or higher education system and the uh, European Union. Uh, about this whole issue about being educated via um, uh, doing university studies or being skilled by them. Um, it sounds like the same, but it isn't because um, that's the point that also uh, the, the rector you quoted uh, has made. It is important from our point of view that um, it is more than an educational machine responding to um, needs formulated maybe by the economy or so on. But as important as it might be or is to make that point very strong, I think we've moved a bit beyond that. And I, I would like to illustrate it in the following questions. I mean, every year we discuss the issue, should we get rid of the Bologna process? And that does not mean to get to get rid of it, does not mean to stop having like bachelor, master and, and exchange and uh, the possibility uh, to go from A to B and, and, and back so on. But shouldn't we stop the process as being a state-driven process? Shouldn't we like grab it for ourselves, for the higher education institutions, for the university system? But I think um, the recent developments um, have clearly shown that the Bologna process is uh, more or less, I think, a very good tool. I mean, keep in mind that we have uh, we had Belarus joining the process. And uh, if you look at the situation now, I think it's more or less unimaginable that we could achieve something like that, uh, such a huge political step like the Bologna process was in, in days like these. So uh, we should be glad that we have that and we will continue to have that to be forced to have that balance between, let's say, state influence on it um, and the, the self-governing rights and approaches that come with the university system or from the university sector. But um, today, I would say that um, what we can witness in the last year is a more and more, let's say, content-loading approach to the Bologna uh, process in a sense that issues like democratic values, um, autonomy of science, autonomy of also freedom of speech and so on, so on have more or less entered into the Bologna process. So um, I think we can really close the circle that um, th this, this, uh, this approach to say it's only, let's say a technical qualification machine providing uh, the economic sector with skills. We're beyond that, I think. We have the Bologna process as a really good let's say, a kind of shape or a kind of tool which we can use and we can put all the content in that we want. Um, and one of it would be that um, that um, education is a kind of wholesome process 
are producing more than skills are, but it also is a kind of pan-European process that um, transports our values, um, our ideas, uh, how to interact with each other. You wouldn't see these sharp um, distance between an approach of being like an educated person as a result of having gone to university or being merely um, a let's say, an artificial product of, soft, of some teaching machine. I guess we're beyond that, but it's good to keep that difference in mind. Thank you. And Vanessa, can, can, I, can I turn to you and, and ask you, I mean, so, so you sit at this interface all the time and you, you um, I mean, you were really successful in, in generating a, a strategy for universities that in a sense has been now endorsed and by, you know, and, and in a sense it's, it's um, uh, it's with member states, you know, the commission has endorsed it. So on one level, we are very much in the consciousness of policymakers more widely, but it still feels very much to the sector that this point of deceleration is very hard to communicate, that we also need that, that aspect to, 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 what, to who we are. Is, do, do, are politicians, you think, receptive to, the, to, to, to this notion that actually we also still need to maintain these spaces for reflection and for maybe, you know, for, 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 for creating the well-rounded individual alongside the skills and all the rest the policymakers need us to do or or and, and other maybe ways in which we should um formulate this in better so that politicians get it sorry your sound thanks a lot for your for your question and first i would like to very much uh, welcome the very interesting discussions before and especially on this uh, inside paper drafted by by Joe. it has very much welcome and um, i hope you've seen that it has really fed into the european strategy for for universities um actually last year we took that time of reflection when we had all this consultation process and uh, we met a lot last year if you remember you also told me that you were brain out you know with all the, the meetings that we had so we have taken that time of uh, of reflection uh, at the same time what the sector told us it has is, was that it was important to take action, so to reflect and take action to move forward. You know, with, with Bologna, we have been telling, and, and especially as uh, Jens Peter said, is, is that at one point we were wondering, are we done with Bologna? Do we need to continue with Bologna? It's so slow, you know, uh, and we don't see things really moving up. We're talking about a lot about quality assurance and traumatic recognition and it takes time, you know. So um, what we have been asking, what the sector has been asking to us is how the European education realm, because we have some tools that we don't have through Bologna, can accelerate the implementation of the Bologna principles and the Bologna instruments. And it's exactly what we are trying to do with some of the flagships of this European strategy for universities when it comes to the European Universities Initiative that uh, Karen and Joe mentioned before. We see it as an accelerator for change to implement many of the Bologna tools and the Bologna principles that are there, but are not, that are not always implemented everywhere or they are implemented in a way that are hampering cooperation between the higher education institutions. So I think there is this need of acceleration, acceleration for deeper cooperation between the higher education institutions across Europe, acceleration of um, implementing the Bologna principles and the Bologna instruments, but at the same time, take the time for reflection when it comes to um, new initiatives that we have been proposing. So if I check the example, for example, of this objective, well, I, I will take the example of two, two flagships. One is to work towards a possible joint European degree. Another one is to work towards a possible, and I use the word possible, which is very important, a possible legal status for alliances. But what is very important, and we discussed that together with the member states last week in Paris, with a meeting with all the directors general responsible for high division, they told us that we need to take the time to reflect on these two flagships, for example, step by step. That we should not jump too quickly, too rapidly, and that we need to take the time 
to assess, to test, to evaluate, together with the universities, the higher education institutions, sector, and together with the member states. So it's really to find the right balance uh, between this acceleration with initiatives that can accelerate reforms, but at the same time, not jump too quickly and takes the time, take the time to do it step by step. And, and, and can, I, can I maybe, I mean, because you mentioned European universities and, and that was also um, a, a really important point, uh, a sort of concluding point uh, of Karin, the, the, this, this hope that in a sense European universities can also serve as, as a, an innovative space to, to reflect and to, um, and to decelerate again. So, so again, we, we, if we continue with this, with this, with this tension, right? And so, on one level, they are really about transformative change, and that's always been the, 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 the emphasis, right? They're test beds for something, for or something else, and 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 of course, they have been created for a reason. So, it's not to deny this. But at the same time, you do have these extraordinarily wonderful minds, you know, be they students or, you know, academic staff or administrative staff together in a room. Very often they get to know each other, they de develop trust and they have opportunities they've, they've never had before to really take a step back and really take time to really think through what's going on. Or, or, or you know, and that, of course, that's where real innovation comes in, but it has to be open ended and it takes time. Do, do, it, it, do European universities, given the impatience of all the policymakers around them, is it realistic to expect them to, to also provide the frameworks for, for de deceleration in that way? Well, this is very important that um, we give the time and the space for these European universities alliances to test, to experiment and to reflect. And indeed, what we have been discussing with all the directors responsible for higher education, is that it's not a project, but it's a long-term initiative. So we need to give them that framework and that space to think long-term, while at the same time, be also a catalyst for change so that it can benefit the wide sector. And um, it's not easy to grasp it and to understand it. It's, it's, it's a new initiative, it's new. We have never done that before. So we are all learning together. And we, uh, while we go away together, be it at the university level, at the national ministries level, and at uh, European level, what we have seen is that it has already been a catalyst for change. You know, we have really listened to the to these uh, to these European universities together with many other stakeholders, like the Gint, uh, to reflect in the European strategy for universities. Some of the the flagships like. Um, John degree or, or legal status comes from proposals from the European universities, but what we are aiming at is that these possible solutions uh, for those who wish uh, uh, to go in that way, we're not imposing at all, but is that it's, it's an additional instrument uh, for any kind of alliances of higher education institutions, not only from these uh, European universities, like the cancer recommendation that we have presented together with the strategy, provide first steps to address the many challenges that many alliances of higher education institutions are facing when it comes to implementing joint transnational education activities, when it comes to quality assurance, etc. So, these are very important recommendations for member states and for the Commission to facilitate these joint transnational education activities across Europe. And that will benefit the entire sector, not only the European universities. So you see that already after three years, they are really, really uh, bringing changes in terms of policy development. While at the same time, of course, we need to give them support to implement uh, the fantastic objectives that we all have at all political levels for these European universities to put in place um, this innovative, this um, pedagogical innovation that were discussed in the, in the panel before. So we need to give them the framework, both in terms of funding, but also in terms of policy development. So I will take a very concrete example that we, that was raised before by Karen and Joe. This pedagogical innovation is absolutely key to educate and to provide the skills to the young generation, but also to the lifelong learners. 
And for that, you need to be able to do universities to develop that. So when we talk about pedagogical innovation, we think about living labs, we think about uh, implementing lifelong learning opportunities that can lead to micro credential etc. And, and Joe and Karen were absolutely right that actually we need to give time uh, to staff, to academics, to develop that, to be trained. And this needs to be valorized and recognized within their careers, which is not always the case at the moment. Mm -hmm. So that is why we are proposing to work together with the sector to come up with a proposal um, to valorize this, this, uh, this uh, academic careers part. Um, the Commission is developing the you know, cancer recommendation and, and research assessment, which is also very really important. Reforms are needed, but we also need to bring the complementary aspect, which is the, the teaching aspect of the, of the careers of, of an academic. So you see, this is something that we want to take the time to reflect, but at the same time, to bring forward improvements and support for the, for the academics. Good. It's Thanks. it's a long answer for sure. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's good, and I really, I, I really, really hope we can come back to, to that point. Um, but let me let me just um, uh, turn to uh, Rumitsa and 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 uh, maybe um, just ask you how how this looks from your national perspective. Well, I mean, in fact. You sit at a, different, at a different level, but you, of course, in a sense, you can both look at the national and the European, given your huge experience also in in, in CIVIS and and uh, at the at the EUA, and so uh, and, and 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 Unica. Um, do do you see that in a sense there is a there is an opportunity really for for European universities to expand that that space and to really innovate not just. Um, uh, processes and and innovations, but also the, the the genuine quality and depth of what we do. Yeah, I think, thank you very much, uh, Jan, for um, this interesting uh, question and uh, also for uh, the selection was a relevant, very relevant uh, quotation of um, Karin's, uh, and I like it very much. I did the same like you. It was probably the main central message uh, sent and. Uh, um, from this perspective, uh, please allow me just to um, add uh, to your comments that uh, Karin was referring to uh, tensions between uh, disruption, accelerations, growth, development. And finally, uh, she used a very nice word, uh, contemplation, if you remember, was something very interesting. And uh, just coming back to your question, um, I'm raised on the agenda the possibility to um, have um, uh, at the level of the member states some contemplative attitudes to what's happening in this moment at the European uh, arena, and uh, that could be a point if, if the member states or institutions uh, are remaining in the contemplations or uh, if they are going to change something, and, uh, and that's uh, the idea of having uh, next step on the agenda. From this perspective, um, uh, I uh, would like to um, stress that uh, in the case of some alliances, and you mentioned uh, uh, here CIVIS, and I'm very uh, happy to represent the CIVIS voice together with Karin and uh, uh, colleagues from the Tübingen universities as well. We have starting to do something uh, for uh, making an important change. At the very beginning, the new alliances project has been only appreciated by uh, our colleagues and peers as a project and itself. And um, what very difficult um, mission uh, for our team to transform and to create some transition between a project to a process. Sometimes uh, when we are referring to the Bologna process, I like it very much that uh, it's more or less referring to the process, not to a structure, or restructuring process, because uh, sometimes there is a risk to offer an only one perspective as a restructuring studies, lengths, uh, durations, uh, number of credits, ECTS, but it's not the case. And Michael, it's uh, next to us here and uh, very important to underline that a message sent by the community to uh, the EUA was uh, learning and teaching initiatives. And that was an important message. And also another one uh, last year, uh, an important paper, Universities Without Walls. They are starting to um, more or less putting uh, the community 
in a reflective and contemplative way, not for uh, doing nothing, but in, in a sense to be active on reflecting on new pedagogies. And I'm coming from educational uh, sciences, I'm an educationalist, and I believe that uh, all new changes in this segment will be based on new pedagogies and innovative pedagogies and new curricula and new development ways for the new curricula. But I'm wondering myself, and um, this is my, my last uh, comment on that, um, uh, we, we need to, um, to uh, probably ask ourselves what do we want to change in this redesigning the academic curricula in relationship with the new ways of teaching and learning? Because we are referring uh, to practices, but in the same times with some philosophy, new philosophy. One of them, micro-credentials, all the people are using this new concept, but this is not a new concept in itself. It's a new philosophy for redesigning uh, more or less the curricula in an academic way. Uh, yeah. And if we should uh, give up, we need to ask uh, in favor of what? And uh, sometimes this process is more or less a process of learning and relearning by um, taking into account the unlearning uh, uh, middle area. And we are aware that sometimes uh, university professors and academic staff should be trained for playing a new role. Um, in conclusions, from the national perspective, uh, the contemplative attitude has been changed uh, in the last two years. And now we have become more and more uh, aware that uh, the way for being active is uh, uh, it's the more important. And from um, some uh, alliances, uh, the perspective from the project, from a project to a process, that's the point in order to be shifted at the community and the people who are in charge with uh, dealing with this process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Michael, if, if, if I turn to you, and, and I, I, I want to put, ask you something from the Q&A about European universities, but if I, if I put that, for, for, uh, for the second question, I mean, I just really want to pick, pick directly up. I mean, your strategy was mentioned, um, University Without Walls. And, and, and I wonder whether, um, you know, as, as if, I, if I reflect on Karen's talk, there is, there is a sense in which as you expand the university, you massify it, you, you connect it to societal utopias, then the, the connection to society becomes ever closer. But that means almost by definition, that the demands of all these students who basically just want to get jobs <laughs> increase. And the, the demands of societal stakeholders increase the more you engage with them. So does this automatically not mean that this old sense of, well, these universities as these contemplative spaces, that, that goes. And it has to go because universities fundamentally have changed in what they are. And in a sense, through your strategy, even though it's titled, you've, mm. you've acknowledged that. Mm. Uh, maybe they have never been the ivory towers as we, as, as, as we present them, you know, and I think they always have been much more reactive to society, but I completely agree with you. They have to do it in a completely different way than they used to do this. And I think this is something that we are facing and this is what we try to respond on. But I think it's not a question of either you engage with the society or you develop uh, science and research and provide true education in the sense of building. I, I think there are ways of combining this. Um, <clears throat> and um, maybe it's, it's good to go back to this uh, point that was being made, the concern about uh, commercialization of higher education and about No. Aligning it with industry interests ago, it's not completely gone. Of course, I'm interestingly, I, I don't think that the Bologna process was actually the culprit there who promoted it. On the contrary, and if you look on what has been discussed in the Bologna process, and that was has, what has been published, so the higher education as a public good, um, the emphasis on academic freedom and institutional autonomy, uh, but also the um, definition of, of, of uh, the purpose of university learning, which was provided by the Council of Europe, which includes employment, employability, but also uh, personal development and the uh, creation of knowledge. So uh, this is far away from um, commercial and very, how do you say, um, 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 utilitarian agenda. 
I think the question that I found, what I found interesting in Karin's presentation, and thanks to all four presenters, actually, these were really very interesting and thought-provoking inputs. What I picked up from Karin was this quote from Peter Scott that he did in 2012. And Peter Scott was always a bit ahead of the game, I would say, and had the gift to, to put um, things that everybody felt somehow in, in very clear words. And I think that was probably the moment also when the Bologna process started to change and move from what it has been before, a decade of structural, mainly top-down reforms, not, not everywhere very successful, needed a lot of second and third rounds uh, to get things really going, to, to move to something different. And I think what we see today is the Bologna process has moved away from the 10 action lines. Um, it also doesn't try to add new action lines. We see much more that it becomes about um, a collaborative process involves a lot of peer learning, which includes not only the ministries, but also increasingly higher education and QA agencies. And maybe this is something that we should uh, consider. I mean, not as the only possibility, but I agree with what Jens Peter said. It's easy to say we do away with it and we try to come up with something better that might not be so easy. And if we look at it also from the point that this is a, an established and rather robust process it works somehow not terribly fast as we have seen mm -hmm. okay but it also has some means mainly thanks also to the european commission who, which, which puts a lot of funding into it and, and into projects and it also has a kind of memory and i think that is also one of the reasons why this is has got the international reputation it's not just something we meet we discuss and then uh, uh, things go on but we have an agenda actually. And I think the point that Peter Scott also made in his quotation is um, how to make good use of it from the perspective of the university sector. So the points that uh, Karin, Joe, Aune and Berit has mentioned here, I think that should be really discussed in the, in the Bologna process. And here's a bit of a conundrum still, I think. Um, while I know the situation that if you talk to university leadership, they are not really interested in the Bologna process and the issues that it addresses. And I hear, on the other hand, from the university sector that it has the feeling Bologna doesn't really pay attention to what universities actually need. So I think there's something that we can, where we can bridge and uh, build up better connection. And I think this is on both sides on the way. I mean, in the Bologna process, there's a discussion on uh, how to work, work more with the sector to become more collaborative and more participatory on the side of the institutions. I have never heard uh, so much, so many rectors talking about recognition and quality assurance. And this is indeed uh, one of the impacts or of the merits of the uh, university alliances, which bring things that were done in the institution somewhere also to the attention of the institutional leadership. I mean, to put it bluntly, if you just want to get a few students mobile, the international office always finds a way. But if you want to get 50% of your student population mobile, then you need robust uh, processes and instruments. And I think this is what we are discussing at the moment. So the instruments are actually there. We have to find out, are they really good enough? And if not, what has to be changed uh, to make them good enough for our purposes? Jens Peter? Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, just, just to assist uh, Michael um, in, in several respects. I think what we witness now, only talking about Germany, which is a relatively large system, um, the, the, the old um, opposites um, skills here and uh, maybe kind of building um, on, the, on the other hand, they start to dissolve also, I think, from the perspective of the industry sector, because it's quite obvious that there's only one crucial skill that we need in the future, and this is to deal with uncertainty. And that's a typical academic qualification. And so it's, it does not make any sense for the industry sector to ask us for a specific qualification, which is like worth a year or two, and then it's gone and no longer valid. But um, to have people who are qualified in a way that um, makes it possible for them to deal with unexpected situations, to find no solutions in an ever faster changing world. And I think that also solves a bit the issue of being, of universities, of being like temples of uh, contemplation. You need that 
uh, element of self-reflection contemplation to think about the whole picture if you want to develop this skill, this crucial skill to deal with uncertainty. So I think uh, if, we, if we make it right, things can connect in this point. Thank you, Vanessa. Your, your entire body language tells me that you want to get in on this, but uh, can, uh, as, as you uh, respond, can I also ask you maybe to reflect on the, um, on, on the points made in the Q&A or the questions in the Q&A, which is really around the relationship between, I, I take it, the European University uh, alliances and the Bologna process. You know, so so um, is this about, are the European alliances about diversifying the Bologna process? Are they, I mean, it's, it's kind of in, in, in line with, with the comments that were made, but but if you could maybe re reflect on this. Um, and and an another point I think made by Roberto Vecchi or, or thrown into the discussion is whether we are now, um, in a sense, we need to rethink the Bologna process in line of the changes that, that, that have happened since it was first um, um, initiated, or whether you could argue it being a process, it is changing quite naturally in response to also what, 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 what um, uh, Michael has, has, has just said. So, so maybe just to frame, frame your response also in, in, in those two ways. Yeah, no, I wanted to react to, to what uh, Mikhail said, and I cannot agree, agree more with that, uh, with the fact that basically we have the Bologna tools. We are building on that to go faster in terms of deepening the cooperation between the high education institutions within Europe, with, for example, the, the European universities and other instruments. Uh, so we need DSGs, we need all the Bologna instruments, but at the same time, um, we expect as well what we do in the context of the European education area to then have an impact as well back into Bologna. So it's two process, if you want, on one side the Bologna process and on the other side the high education, the high education strength of the European education area that are nourishing um, each other. And I cannot agree more with what Michael said, that indeed what we are talking about is about moving 50% of students within an institution. And here you need, you need really structural changes as compared to a few mobilities. And this is what we are trying to do with the European Universities Initiative that are Three that are really catalysts for change is how do you organize this 50% mobility? You need strong trust, strong recognition, automatic recognition, you need strong to build trust, you need strong quality assurance system. And all this, you know, we, we, we can build on the, on the Bologna instruments, but maybe, as Michael said, to reach this 50% mobility, we need maybe um, an upgrade of this Bologna instrument. Also, when it comes to, um, and I was really very happy that, by what Romitsa said as well, um, when it comes to lifelong learning and micro credentials, you know, it really requires training, it really requires a reflection and reflection uh, on how we learn and how we teach. It links also to this uh, pedagogical innovation. So, um, so basically, all this progress that we are making together, I'm sure will bring necessary changes in the current Bologna tools and instruments. Mm. I hope it answers some of the questions in the chat. Romita, you want to respond? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jan. I, I'm, I'm coming back a little bit uh, deeper on what Vanessa was previously saying, related to micro-credentials. Um, um, if you are interested to apply uh, this uh, concept uh, to one alliance, which uh, we're trying to uh, just to transform uh, the internal curricula, it was not very easy for the very beginning to understand uh, the real sense of micro credentials. And uh, somehow, micro credentials uh, was uh, um, more or less confused with an instrument for only for lifelong learning and creating bridges between universities and uh, a labor market uh, and uh, the market of uh, training, uh, continuing professional development and other instruments. And uh, we have introduced um, more or less a transition uh, concept, uh, micro-credentials philosophy, because uh, in the respect of the Bologna process, we have learned an important lesson from this, and Michael uh, was previously mentioned. 
um, the continuity and the transitions should be ensured by uh, some way uh, of um, uh, reflection and uh, more or less a professionalized way for experts who are just contributing to this concept. And, in, and I give you an example uh, uh, from CIVI's perspective. We have introduced modularization as a substitute for micro-credentials in terms of creating um, um, experiences, learning experiences for our students and creating some embedding uh, ways for introducing uh, these learning experiences in the traditional curricula. And so the question has been raised. Uh, in this moment, we are talking about the real way of micro-credentials, which is an important concept for redesigning and redefining new curricula in the next uh, decade or we are just uh, making uh, a transition from a reflection which has been uh, focused on, uh, on a curriculum design to another way for creating learning experiences for our students. If we are not um, looking to our students' needs and to try to support uh, their interest and their motivation, uh, probably uh, what's happening now, uh, we are going to uh, fail to, uh, uh, or um, not so much success uh, uh, proposing uh, for, for this stage of discussion. And um, this uh, is an important uh, reflection for all uh, four people from the speaker. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Mich uh, Michael, can, can I just ask you uh, really about another topic that was that was really meant that was quite prominent in, in, in the discussions thus far in, in the first part of this seminar, which is really around the the, the relationship between the national and the international, or, or in, in this sense, the European. Um, and, and uh, you know, Aona mentioned this really prominently with, with a number of examples. These, these, these really, and it's a question around languages, it's a question around the national mission or, or the mission of the university, as it were. Um, and, in it, and it's also inherent in the nature of the university, if you think. I mean, we, so, so we started with Bologna as, as something, as, a, as an institution that was arguably much more kind of, <laughs> that, that wasn't limited by national boundaries, as it were. Um, then we've had, as Karen described, the, 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 this moment of the 19th century when the, na the nation became much more central to the universities. And now we have these, these, these tensions that, 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 that go with, with, with the European higher education area or the, the, the European um, education area. Um, what, what do you make of this? What, what, is, what is the best way to think about the, the relationship, as it were, between the national and international from your perspective as somebody who is representing these national universities as a European, at a European level all the time? I mean, we, we are not the only sector who has the problem of national <laughs> boundaries, so to say. And I think the uh, European Union and, of course, also the Bologna process stands for it, the attempts, are, I mean, how to get to an approach towards globalization and uh, foster and emphasize the positive aspects that it can have and uh, make it work for, uh, for our societies. So, but I mean, it, I, I found these these examples that in particular Una also quoted were very, very interesting because it shows you uh, the diversity and also why we have the diversity and that um, being at a German university in terms of language policies is probably not the same as being at an Estonian university. And I think that's also something that has been emphasized by Karin in, she made, I think she referred to dis disjunctive thinking. And um, that's probably something that when you work in at the European level, you always encounter that we all know that, yeah, that there's the feeling we need a standard and then it has to be done everywhere the same. And this is not the way of how we would solve our problems. Uh, uh, so I think that's, that's the point that I have here. And that also somehow um, explains why, uh, why, um, why we all cherish, um, transnational exchanges and how, why they are so beneficial and so transformational um, for students who are mobile, for staff, for institutions, but also for, for policymakers, for national ministries. I mean, we learn from each other. We are a bit limited in our imagination. When I speak the word university, you immediately imagine the university that you attended. <laughs> and while we know that they are different everywhere, it's very difficult to imagine how different they are. So I think these um, 
processes that we have built up for transnational, for European exchange and collaboration, they are a fantastic opportunity. And Rodomita just explained it, how you can um, experiment, try things out, explore them in collaboration and in discussion with partners in, in other parts of Europe and internationally and then uh, see what is a good way forward. And that might have different answers in different places. Mm -hmm. So I think this is how we, how we deal with this. As much, of course, alignment as, as, as possible and probably needed, but keep this diversity. This is really what makes it so rich. And this is also what you have already at national level. The institutions, one institution from, to the other is, is very different here. And we have, and we have somehow policy processes which are not good probably for solving all these problems, but at least we can address them and try to find solutions. Mm -hmm. um, can, 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 I, can I ask the same question, but rephrase this slightly, uh, Jens, Peter and Remitza to you before then turning to, to you, Vanessa, for a final comment on this, because I, it, it, you know, if, if, I, if I reflect on our entire seminar series, then for we, me, one of the most uh, important um, arguments that it really made me think um, um, and in really unexpected ways was um, um, a contribution by uh, Art van Bochover in, in when we talked about the, um, the, the importance and merits of internationalization. And, you know, I think probably all of us in this virtual room agree that internationalization, you know, the more the better because it's, it's so important, because it's the DNA of our universities. But he was really looking at, um, in this case, in this particular case, the, 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 the region of Leiden, and he was, he was reflecting on why it is that, in a sense, you have these international students and then they stream to certain metropolitan areas and they, they stream to the kind of metropolitan areas that they're comfortable with, that, that are also global, international, etc. And, and, the, and the question that raised to me, what, and, and so he was asking the question, well, or, or that raised the question, are there certain forms of internationalization that are really problematic for the region that are really contributing to the hemorrhaging of certain regions, maybe in, in you know, outlying areas of, of any nation, really? Um, and so the, the, that raises the question of how do we do internationalization well? How do we ensure that we do internationalization that strengthens Europe and that strengthens all of Europe and not just the, the kind of areas that are already really strong and booming? Um, I don't know yet, Peter Rumitzer, do you have any, any maybe reflections on that or answers to that? If, if, I, if I might start, I mean, for the, for the German system, it's... Uh, maybe a bit of a different animal. There's a famous number, uh, 59. It means that um, you're n when you're in Germany, you know where there's no point where you're more than 59 kilometers far from a university. It's a bit simplified, but that's basically that's basically what you can say. So it's um, uh, it's as it is a large system with like 400 universities of all different kinds. Um, it's very well distributed. Uh, nevertheless, we see um, we see that concentration, like in 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 Munich or in Berlin areas, and and so on. That's true, but it's it's a bit, let's say, mediated by the fact that uh, there's a strong distribution of the of the university system in in Germany. But but let me make one point, looking at the future. I mean, Vanessa stressed the the meaning, and I think everyone agrees to that of the European university networks. What what makes them special is that it's the first time that we have at least on the European level, an approach which combines all four, let's say, four corners of the famous rectangle, like research, um, like transfer, like teaching, learning, and like culture. Uh, you can frame it in a different way, but that's basically the thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to that point because um, if we talk about the Bologna process, teaching and learning and everything connected to it, we must never forget that research leads the university activities. And the research scape will change dramatically. One thing is um, that we are at the, the verge of the open access age. So the, the knowledge will be distributed in a completely different way in the future. That, that's one point. And the second one is quite obvious. I mean, while we talk here, we have uh, very many, many questions from our media in Germany about the relationship to China and how, why we do not re, uh, react the same way as we reacted to the Russian um, aggression against Ukraine, given the news we had from China in the last weeks and so on. So we don't know how the uh, landscape, the research landscape will look like. And I mean, if you look at Russia, and their contribution to the global 
output in research papers, we can maybe, I mean, it's a harsh word, but we can maybe live with it at least for a while not to have these contributions. If you imagine we would have the same with China and cut them off from the global research dialogue, that would be a completely different game. So my point is, if we, um, if we look at the Bologna process in the future and everything connected to teaching and learning, we must always do that before the background um, of how the international research landscape will change in the future years. And then we can maybe adopt the Bologna process also to issues you raised, Jan, about how to uh, put it or shape it in a way that helps all the regions in, in Europe the, the best way. So that would be my short comment for the maybe bigger picture. Thanks. And that's a very a hugely important bigger picture indeed. Thank you. Uh, Rumitsa, do you want to respond and comment? Um, uh, looking to, to the arguments uh, received, the internationalization in this moment uh, for our universities uh, uh, is more or less linked to uh, these two main processes. One is the Bologna process, uh, which was feeding away. And um, uh, now we are looking to the European university strategies. And uh, our institutions are just trying to making some uh, connection with two uh, political processes. But in the same time, we are understanding that from the political way, we need to adapt our leadership, governance systems, uh, learning and teaching areas, students, mobility, and so on. And um, uh, in, from my perspective, internationalization will not be a separate way for approaching universities in the near future. In 10 years from now, starting with the reflection on universities without walls, I'm sure that European universities will be uh, much more internationalized than uh, uh, they are now. And um, uh, a message which is important is that from this new European way of having universities or designing or shaping universities, um, we um, just reflecting on the transformative way, which includes uh, innovative uh, uh, pedagogies and uh, new highly motivational learning experiences for our students. They have changed their personal profiles in this uh, period of uh, pandemic situation, and we should adapt our experiences, as uh, Karin was uh, telling us, to rethink teaching, adapted, being adapted to what's happening in this moment, moment through flexibilities, embedded diverse mobilities, and of course, adapt our teaching to students' uh, expectations and students' needs. That's more important. And this is internationalization in real sense. But, but Remitza, just, just to, just to um, maybe add, add a brief question. I mean, I, I, what, what I really enjoyed and, and made me think about Karen's paper was that in a way, I mean, to think about digitalization, not just as another tool that, you know, as another pedagogy out there, but as something that changes the essence of who we are because it, it kind of makes what we do so quantifiable. Right, and so so that's I mean, that's a fundamental shift, no? Yeah, I fully agree. Yes, this this is the way that European ways of life. It's a part of the European strategy. is very important to understand, and so we can use uh, these um, um, strategical lines for making internationalization in another way. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, can I ask you for maybe final comment in this panel? Um, really thinking about the national, the international, uh, but also I, I, I think the, 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 the points that Jens Peter threw in uh, or brought into the discussion about the wider global picture and the way in which research fundamentally changes and changes at a rapid pace and which that also needs to affect our pedagogies and, and, and the, uh, you know, so there's a, there's a lot maybe for you to maybe reflect on. Yeah, no, it's it's a lot of questions. Also, your previous question on the international, the internationalization landscape, and uh, how it can be a problem. And I think um, in internationalization, what we need to make sure is that it is as inclusive as possible, inclusive geographically to avoid the brain drain and ensure brain circulation. And that is really a, a big issue. And that is why it was important in, when we discussed with the member states about the European University Initiative. But it was very important that uh, it really brings together the different parts of Europe, bringing north, south, east, west. And one of the fantastic outcomes is that we have seen new cooperation and new cooperation flows that we have not seen before. 
So that's, that's really interesting. The second element is that it should not stay in the capitals, but also go to the rural areas. So very interesting to see that we have as well, um, I speak about the European Resources Alliances, but I would speak about all different cooperation projects through Erasmus Plus, because when we speak about internationalization, is to make it accessible to a wide range of high education institutions. So, so all different types of, uh, of cooperation. So that was, that was the first point. And then on research changing very rapidly, the fact that all knowledge can be in, in open access, yes, fully agree. Um, first, that's very important because that makes knowledge much more accessible to a wide range of, of learners. And this has, uh, of course, an impact on, on the way we learn and the way we teach with all these data and, and, uh, and knowledge that is uh, easily uh, accessible. But my hope would be also that education can also have an impact on research. Uh, you know, when we speak about this new innovative, this new pedagogical innovation with the challenge-based approach, more interdisciplinary, um, you know, approaches, if this could have also an impact on the way research is done, that can be also more interdisciplinary, I think it would be um, a win-win uh, improvement, both for on the research and the education aspect. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa. And uh, I'm afraid I need to leave it here, but maybe just to, to I, I just want to, um, again, I mean, I, I mentioned this already briefly, but Roberto Vecchi's uh, point, I think is still really important, the question of, uh, it's very much also in, light, in, in, in line with Karen's uh, comments that the, 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 the complexity of Bologna is, is surely a process. And Michael, if I, if, uh, if I can just may ask you to reflect uh, specifically on Roberto's um, points that in a sense we, um, we need, we are really moving from, or we need to think about uh, Bologna as a new paradigm, really, of, of one way we've, we've gone from administrative processes to, in a sense, the, the, the embracing of shared differences. I mean, is that, is that a fair? I, I think so. I think that's absolutely right. And in a way, it, it, it mirrors much more what the universities really do, uh, of course, with the exception of what uh, Jens Peter said, uh, no research, but also this is increasingly uh, addressed now and um, to enhance uh, at least exchanges between the European our structures that we built up for uh, research and the era, uh, the European education area, and uh, what Vanessa mentioned already, and then the EHEA, the BFUG. So I think that's a good point. And I think there is, this is a call for, for both sides, if I may say so. I mean, in the Bologna process, it's discussed on how we can open up really and uh, have also more impact and communicate better on what is actually done there and how to enhance participation. But I think it's all so it needs also the sector to stand up and say we want to be part of this and we can contribute to this. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for, for our panelists. If I may just ask uh, um, briefly Joe and um, uh, Karen to just come back and maybe just reflect on what you've heard for a couple of minutes. Joe, if you want to start. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, thanks very much, Jan. So um, I think uh, I've made so many notes, but uh, I'll try and be very succinct. Uh, I think what we are hearing is how much, in order to move forward, we really need the legacy of the past and understanding of what's happening right now uh, and an eye to the future. Uh, I think we all agree that the university of the future is connected and is international, but that's not an, a destination, it's not an end product. Internationalization is an ongoing and dynamic process, not a product or a series of products. Its impact on all university practices should do and activities, and it is it itself the process in and through which higher education can adapt, benefit from, and contribute to the global wor world and the, the local ecosystem uh, of our universities. Uh, pedagogic innovation and change, of course, are prerequisite. And as one of you said, change is the only constant. So uh, in, order, in order for this to actually really happen, we need to go beyond the design. Uh, it needs to, innovation and change needs to build on existing good practice. Uh, we need to, this to be identified uh, and it needs to be implemented. We need to use it as a springboard for all new uh, development. And to achieve it, we need an understanding of the matrix that goes with the educational change time and pace. So this, in my view, should be reflected much more in calls, deliverables, 
progress report, the whole rest of the way that we have been socializing everything that we actually do on pedagogic innovation and, and bring that uh, much closer to the way to everyday practice. Um, I want to uh, move to the next steps and how uh, as a team uh, we are uh, in, in, and in the context of the, the Guild uh, Strategic Lead Education Group, uh, how we are taking some of that already on board and we're working towards translating the paper and the experience we're accumulating from those excellent seminars to unpacking the experience of members are, are, are had, are, have and are having with joint degrees and the ways this can feed into the vision for a European degree that uh, will be easy and recognized and will be very sort of central to the strategy. Um, and in order to achieve the, the strategy, but also the vision more importantly, and, and this is what we heard from everybody in terms of the the vision of the mission of universities and, and sort of national policy frame, international, uh, we need joint effort. Joint effort is the only way forward. Uh, and we also need the spaces to do what we've been doing today. Uh, and, 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 and we've made much progress. And, and I think we've, uh, the vision in the launch was to uh, provide, uh, to start the conversation, provide a framework, start the conversation. Uh, and I think um, in and, and, and the roadmap to change, and I think we've made much progress. The next steps are critical. And what I would like to see is that we commit to not allow the opportunity to pass us by. We need to continue joining and working together uh, so that transformation uh, is not, does not remain a high level aspiration uh, or is not only some uh, pilots or some designs or more experience, but becomes a reality. The reality that will be experienced in our institutions uh, and the legacy that we leave behind. Um, I'm going to stop before I do that. A personal note for me, uh, I would like, because I think I can see Jan, he will take the floor and never give it back to me. Uh, so, <laughs> well, for this seminar at least. Um, I would like to thank my colleagues, uh, Karen Berry and Anna, for a generation of time and spirit. It has been a privilege uh, to be in the team. Uh, I can't tell you how uh, intensive, uh, fantastically stimulating exciting uh, it is. It is an absolute privilege. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, all the future uh, work uh, that, uh, that, that we're doing together. I would like to especially thank Karen for this wonderful closing seminar that is the very important milestone of our work and our collaboration. Uh, and of course, I would like to thank uh, from I and the Guild for enabling, supporting and hosting, uh, hosting this amazing journey of the past yeah. year uh, and uh, the support for the future aspirations. You have been a wonderful host. Uh, I would like to thank Ivana and the communication team. Uh, we couldn't have done it um, without you. Uh, thank you to the communication team for bringing the work to the sector and amplifying the voice and the reach. Uh, and of course, uh, last and uh, very important and most special thanks to Jan, um, both as the Guild Secretary General and a colleague and professor at the University of Warwick uh, for bringing us together, enabling the team, uh, the significant input, uh, being fantastic host uh, and leading the project. So thank you very much, Jan, uh, and I'm going to pass the floor back to you. Thank you. Sorry, I, I really don't deserve it. It's really, it's really a, a team effort, and and um, and and here, especially Ivana's uh, all fantastic work. But uh, Karen, yeah, well, I can only you know fully uh, underline what Joe has just said. It has been a wonderful experience, and thank you so much uh, for this last uh, event in the series of workshops we had, and especially many many thanks to this last panel. I, I I'm so grateful. Uh, that we end on the same plane of saying uh, the Bologna process actually always has been much more complex, even uh, in the times when it was perceived to be about uh, technicalities, the way that these were implemented, and this is something that we are also fighting with, right, is because they were implemented in so many different ways uh, that if we think about joint activities, we are encountering um, um, obstacles and difficulties. So the autonomy of the universities never was um, denied or was questioned. Uh, we always um, institutionalized the process the way that we thought appropriate in, in our context. 
But I'm also uh, very much in agreement with you that we have reached a completely different stage in this. And I'm especially um, grateful, and there I also agree with the panelists, that the networks and alliances will be crucial motors of developing the, the process. Um, and um, I also fully concur that what brings us together uh, in the final event is to provide um, the attitudes, the mindsets, but also the skills and knowledges to deal with uncertainty because it will stay with us. And unfortunately, the 21st century has not just been the blessed one so far. Um, we started with 9-11. Uh, we went through crises uh, in the European uh, Union. We have uh, the war in Ukraine right now. Uh, so the first 20 years um, have always been disrupted uh, in, or disruptive in many senses. And so universities will definitely um, uh, be called upon to fulfill their societal missions uh, on all layers of the process. So thank you so very much, um, all of you, uh, for your strong commitment and collaboration in this, in this process. It, it's wonderful to work with you and um, we are very much looking forward to continue the conversation. Thank you very much. And uh, there's no better way to end than those two last statements. I really want to thank the participants again. Thank you for your fantastic time and your fantastic contributions for me really ensuring that we're having these conversations about um, pedagogical transformation uh, and change our universities together in um, so that we don't stay in our silos, but that we really do reflect on what's going on across and that we that we, you know, develop this momentum across. And I think it's really important to note um, that the terrible events in, in Ukraine at the moment, they have been really very much on our minds um, and, and clearly being part of the conversation. Um, and it is really important that uh, one, I'm very grateful for the European Commission to continue to lead some of these dialogues through. And we've heard how, how in a sense the European universities provide this incredibly important space to make, um, to, to bring up all these issues to the highest levels in our universities. But I think I think we also agree that, that we also really need to think about these this momentum in a, in a truly European uh, space and not just uh, so that in that sense, the European Commission and the European Union can maybe help lead that those conversations, but it is something uh, for all of us. And that's also one of the really uh, important achievements of the European higher education areas to really have brought, to have brought us together and to continue to uh, be this important space for us um, as, as we uh, not just reflect on, but also bring about change as we both decelerate and accelerate at the same time. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you so much, Karen, for a fantastic paper. Thank you. Bye-bye.